So Say We All and KPBS in San Diego, welcome to Incoming, the series that features true stories from the lives of America's veterans, told in their own words, straight from their own mouths. I'm your host, Justin Hudnall. Today we're going to be talking with Doug Bradley, author of We Gotta Get Out of This Place, the soundtrack of the Vietnam War. I was very excited to sit down with Doug because when I think of all those Vietnam War movies that influenced my life while I was growing up, I can't not talk about how they also introduced me to The Mamas and the Papas, Hendrix, Creedence Clearwater, the list goes on. And through listening to that music, I was able to experience a sense of connection to baby boomers and better understand how my generation was molded by growing up in the shadows of their experience. And I'm not being hyperbolic when I say that some of the insights Doug dropped on me about music and war and intergenerational conflicts changed my entire perspective on the matter. That's all of the intro I think he needs because the man knows that of which he speaks. So please, without further ado, meet Army veteran and author, Mr. Doug Bradley. This is Doug Bradley. I'm co-author of We Gotta Get Out of This Place, the soundtrack of the Vietnam War, and I'm a Vietnam veteran. Reading a piece from the introduction to our book called The Vietnam Veterans National Anthem. This is how it opens. In early February 1968, CBS Evening News broadcast a segment from Khe Sanh, the outpost in northwest Quang Tri province, where a U.S. Marine base was under siege by the North Vietnamese Army. Vastly outnumbered and unsure of when or if a full-scale attack would begin, Marines played cards, smoked, hunkered down at the sound of incoming artillery, and scrambled to pick up desperately needed supplies dropped by parachute. A young man from Bravo Company of the 3rd Recon Battalion, dirt, grime, and sweat caving his face, answered the CBS reporter John Lawrence's question, how do you keep your spirits going, by saying, I guess we play cards and sing at night. Throughout the segment, a group of a half dozen Marines sat on a bunker, strumming guitars and singing Where Have All the Flowers Gone, a song written by the World War II veteran and pacifist Pete Seeger. Where have all the soldiers gone? Long time passing. The segment faded out as the Marines sang the lines, Where have all the soldiers gone? Gone to graveyards, every one. When will they ever learn? When will they ever learn? Watching the clip almost half a century later, you can damn near hear the words echo in the thick i air. For the Marines at Khe Sanh, and the more than three million other men and women who served in Vietnam, music provided release from the uncertainty, isolation, and sometimes stark terror that reached from the front lines to the relatively secure rear areas known as the air-conditioned jungle. But the sounds offered more than simple escape. Music was a lifeline connecting soldiers to their homes, families, and parts of themselves they felt slipping away. It was the glue that bound the communities they formed in their hooches, base camps, and lonely outposts from the Mekong Delta to the ravines of the demilitarized zone. Both in country and back in the world, as the troops called the United States, music helped them make sense of situations in which, as Bob Dylan put in a song that meant something far more poignant and haunting in Vietnam than it did back in the world, they felt like they were on their own with no direction home. For the fortunate ones who did get back home, music echoed through the secret places where they stored memories and stories they didn't share with their wives, husbands, or children for decades. Music was the key to survival and a path to healing, the center of a human story that's too often been lost in the haze of politics and myth that surrounds Vietnam. So, Doug Bradley, thanks so much for being on Incoming. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Why don't you start us off by talking about your process for collecting the stories that are in We Gotta Get Out of This Place and what motivated you to take on the project? That's a that's a great way to start because the genesis for this was uh, Craig Werner, my co-author, and I. Craig's a professor of Afro-American studies at the uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. Does some wonder. I mean, he's he's a musical genius. I mean, he knows so much about music, and it's part of the cult, popular culture he brings into the classes that he teaches. And so, Craig and I happen to both be at a 
Christmas party at the Vet Center in Madison. And my kids had had his class, and I, I wanted to thank him for being such a good professor. We started talking, and he, you know, he had a segment of his course that he focused on the Vietnam War. And he asked me what I thought of the playlist. My kids had given it to me. He put them on CDs in those days. Now they can just do Spotify lists. And uh, I said, well, you know, I was there in 70 and 71. Mine was a little different. The next thing we knew, six or seven Vietnam vets had sur- sort of surrounded us. And they were saying, well, what about this song? And, you know, did anybody ever play that? Did, did, did anybody talk about this? And Craig and I, we just met. We exchanged this glance like, boy, there is something powerful going on here. We met a couple months later and had a chat and said, you know, we think there's a book here. So we went back to the seven or eight guys that were at the Vet Center Christmas party, started with them and said, and we knew some of these guys, but still, even though the guy, some of them that we knew, there were others we didn't know, Vietnam vets weren't comfortable, weren't encouraged to, weren't supported in telling their stories. They didn't talk about Vietnam. They weren't welcomed home. But we would say to guys and women that we interviewed, well, what about a song? Was there a song when you were there or when, before you went or when you came back home that has sort of stayed with you or sustained you or connected you? And boy, it was like turning on a faucet. Well, and, you know, so from there, my being a Vietnam vet helped to get me into certain networks. Now, re- remember, I mean, you know, uh, the way that uh, survival guilt works, yeah, I don't think I'm privy to getting into you know, the, the first air cav or the first division, um, you know, uh, bulletin boards and listservs. But, you know, somebody we would talk to would validate us. Um, and the next thing you know, the way the networks go is, you know, we'd start hearing from guys around the country. Then we would start make presentations at the Vets Museum in Madison, at LZ Lambeau. They had a welcome home ceremony for Vietnam vets in Wisconsin at the, the Packer Stadium. We started, articles started to be written about us because people were both fascinated by the music. I mean, it's the best music ever. But then, of course, this whole notion of uh, having stories and memories, music-based memories, that veterans were finally sharing after 40, 45, or 50 years. We knew we couldn't cover all the territory we wanted to cover. We wanted to have a, a balance of diversity in terms of geography and ethnicity and ranks and branches of service and men and women. But we were able to track down most of that on our own. Sometimes we went to other sources. There's a great archive at Texas Tech. We found some things there. We had a graduate student of Craig's who had interviewed a bunch of uh, women nurses, female nurses who served in Vietnam and donut dollies. So uh, the combination of some of that, but mostly the networks we got into and the interviews we had and the people we talked to formed the basis for the book. You, uh, you hit on a question I was going to ask. As, as a millennial who was the child of baby boomers, I really grew up in that kind of culture of silence where things weren't openly talked about, but music was used as a way to kind of educate and bridge a gap and inform about the war. Having put this collection together, what do you think the mechanism is about music that allows people who otherwise wouldn't talk about conflict and trauma to, to engage with it? Great question. I, I, I think there's there's a scientific answer that I can't give. You know, we, in the course of doing this, we started reading things like Daniel Levitin's uh, This Is Your Brain on Music and, you know, uh, Six Songs for the World, some of Oliver Sacks' research. And, you know, we, we know from the science that where music and memory in the brain are, they are they're, they're adjacent to one another. So, uh, you know, how a song can trigger a memory. And we've all got those, whether or not you were in Vietnam or not. But it does seem that the more traumatic, difficult, or stressful situation you're under, it even holds more of a power. And I think for us, in that time, radio was our internet. We all shared the same soundtrack. Whether you participated or you protested, whether you stayed or you served, we all had that music. So it was a way for us to connect also with our generation. So I think the fact that the we were the rock and roll generation. Music had just sort of become what it was and how it defined us as a generation. It was in our DNA. The access we had to it and availability and accessibility of it in a variety of media. And the fact that it is the best music ever. I mean, this was a time you had the best of rock, the best of soul, and the best of country. And they all spoke to each other. We don't have that anymore. Back then, you know, uh, Ray Charles and Johnny Cash and Bob Dylan could cross over into those other genres. 
you know, it was, it was just wonderful to see, and the music was fantastic. I think that's got a lot to do with it. This is Doug Bradley, co-author of We Gotta Get Out of This Place, the soundtrack of the Vietnam War. I'm a Vietnam veteran. I'm reading a segment from Chapter 2 of our book entitled Bad Moon Rising. We, in the book, include a number of solos, pieces that were written by Vietnam veterans for this book, some of which were published in other forms. We have Roger Steffen's permission to publish his nine meditations on Jimmy and the Nam. I'm reading from numeral three of Roger's work. Michael Hur's Dispatches says it all. Vietnam was the first rock and roll war, and Jimmy was its forward scout. His music was everywhere, not so much in the bland, censorous, and program from Washington, AFVN, Armed Forces Vietnam Network, but on tape sent by stateside friends and lovers, hoarded like morphine to deaden the constant pain. There was the distant machine gun rat-a-tat-tatting at the opening of Waterfall. Will I live tomorrow? Well, I just can't say. It's a shame to waste your time away like this. The casual violence of Hey Joe. Where are you going with that gun in your hand? And Joe's answer, no less urgent, that I'm stone free to do what I please. I gotta get to got to get away right now. But there was nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. The enemy was everywhere. And sometimes, in a room full of mirrors, we met the enemy and he was us. Lately, things don't seem the same. We're back with our guest, Doug Bradley, author of We Gotta Get Out of This Place, the soundtrack of the Vietnam War. As we sit here in, in 2016, I think it's kind of fair to say that we're in the middle, as a culture, of a second civil rights movement. And uh, the, fir- the last one, of course, was during the Vietnam War, during the time period you're writing about. Could you talk a little bit about how music, especially music in country and back home, highlighted the racial divides, maybe bringing people together, but maybe also highlighting the differences and separations? Oh, uh, you put your finger on it. I mean, we, we talk a lot, and there's a number of stories, uh, great stories in the book, about how music could connect soldiers uh, across ethnic lines and religious lines and you know, parts of the country. And it was that great way that it could be a unifying element. But there were other instances, and we have these in the book as well, where music could be a divisive or dividing factor. And one of the places that held sway was in racial relations. And you know the country was going through all that tumult at the time around race relations. The army and the military are not immune to that. In fact, it's almost like a microcosm. If you had race problems and drug problems and discipline problems in America, boy, you had them in the army. And it was even more intense because it's a sort of a closed society and you're in a war zone for a lot of us. So it, it intensified everything. I will say that just about every combat soldier grunt that we talked to in the course of doing this book didn't care what color the person next to him was if they because they were there they saved each other's life their their priority was taking care of one another but boy when you get back in the rear or you rotate back and you got a little time to, to kick off some steam the jukebox sometimes in the in, you know in the px or at the at the camp would become a place where things would explode and we have plenty of stories in the book about guys who tried to appease that, white guys who tried to get the, the guys who only wanted to listen to Hank Williams and George Jones to not start a brawl with the black guys who only wanted to hear Sam and Dave and James Brown. So at times, music could and did become a lightning rod. It's, it's just one of those sad parts of what was going on in America. You know, the other thing is guys like James Brown came to Vietnam, and, you know, the the Johnson administration did not want James Brown going to Vietnam. They were afraid. They had, a, a, some people at least, not in the military, had a sense of what the racial tension was like, and they thought he would go over and sort of foment kind of revolution. And the great thing was that Brown took a white musician with him. And I think 
we had some soldiers tell us that by seeing a white guy up on the stage with James Brown, that sort of kind of chilled everybody out and didn't divide him. And of course, James Brown's an, an incredible entertainer. When he came back, we have an excerpt in the book we were able to use from Chris Oppie because James Brown had died by the time we got around to interviewing him. Brown talks about that trip, how Hubert Humphrey had to intervene to get him there. There was a lot of resistance. We don't want James Brown in Vietnam. He just recorded Say It Loud, I'm Black, I'm black and I'm Proud. And James says that he thinks even the Viet Cong and the NVA came out to hear him. Yeah, he's that good. That, <laughs> that on the nights when he, was, when he was playing, there was nothing going on. But then he came back and sat down with one of the generals and basically said to him, General, you got a race problem. The guy said, oh, no, no, we're, you know, we got this under control. and we've got, We're educating people. We're taking classes. And he said, General, you've got a problem, and you better take care of it and address it. They never really did. Uh, frankly. Um, by the time I was there in 70 and 71, some units were segregated. There were guys in long bin posts that, you know, black guys that would not hang out with us. We had one white guy in our hooch who worked in our office. Blacks kept to themselves. They had their own dap, their way of greeting one another. It was um, it was not a good time for race relations, uh, and that got played out a lot in the music. It's just so interesting hearing you talk about James Brown in that context because, you know, especially now as we sit like, what, a couple months out from the Super Bowl with everyone losing their minds about Beyonce's performance because she makes a reference to the Black Panthers. And it's, <laughs> it, you'd think it was, you'd think it was just, you'd think she'd burn the stadium down, but it shows you just how sensitive things still are when, when people pull that trigger. I want you to set this up for me because I want, sure. uh, I feel like this is a, one of the most interesting parts of the book is how you transition us through the three presidents who orchestrated the Vietnam War, through the music and how it changed. And I followed that because it, I really felt it kept going after the Vietnam War ended, that, that arc you painted into the modern era and the music of, of the modern wars. So if you could, for our listeners, just explain how you uh, distinguish the soundtracks of JFK, LBJ, and Nixon. One of the ways we decided when we were, we rewrote this book many, many times, you know, it, was, um, it took us about 10 or 11 years. And when we were getting close to what we thought was finishing, we worked with an agent for a while and then went to a bunch of New York publishers and didn't have any success. But that put us through another rewrite. And when we got to UMass Press, who have been wonderful, they're, they're a great university press to work with. They do a great series about the music and the culture of the 60s and the Cold War. And um, we got it accepted. We, of course, had to do some more tweaking and responding. We had some readers read it and give us some feedback. But what we finally decided was, after a number of rewrites, was a great way to sort of work through the book was by looking at the distinctive kind of culture that was existing during the different presidents' handling of the war. So we started with John F. Kennedy's war. We called it JFK's war. Then we went to LBJ's war, Lyndon Johnson, and then Richard Nixon. And that became, became a great way for us to sort of cluster some of the stories and the solos and a lot of the anecdotes we had from veterans and a lot of the music. If you look at JFK's war, which really takes you pre-Gulf of Tonkin, because that happened after he was assassinated, but it's, it's really us taking over the French mandate after their, their defeat of Dien Bien Phu. And, you know, we were there for a bunch of sort of strange and not very understandable reasons. But it's, uh, it's mainly career soldiers. These are guys, some guys who've been in World War II, many of whom had been in Korea, and they're there as advisors and some of the first troops that come into, and we sort of take that up into early into LBJ's presidency. And you would have thought, you know, it was the 1950s. The 1960s hadn't happened yet in terms of, you know, that, that ethos, the military culture, the music right. that they listened to, Pat Boone. Um, that's Tony a, that, I feel like that's a lesser known or remembered part of the early years of the Vietnam War, that there was a body of pro-war music. Bro, oh, yes, there was. And in fact, there wasn't really any anti-war music, if you will, or protest music until until later. So the early music, even though it wasn't, some people still didn't even know what we were doing there, weren't sure of what the cause was. We were going to answer the call. Our dads, you know, we were the sons of World War II vets. They'd saved the world. They'd done their duty. So now we had this new threat. It was communism. So we were gonna, when we were going to get called, we were going to do the same thing. But it was, our, it was sort of our dads or their peers that were there first. And boy, how they were feeling and how they were sizing this up and what they were listening to was not what we were listening to back in America. Now, when LBJ, during his war, 
Um, you know, you look from the early ABJ, LBJs, you're going you know, right after Gulf of Tonkin, the initial buildup into the early 60s, and then you come to the Tet Offensive, Johnson's leaving, and the whole debacle that Walter Cronkite sort of broadcast on television. This is where you really find things changing. You still have some of the early, it's sort of pro-war, but it's really sort of pro-doing your duty. You know, Hello Vietnam by Johnny Wright. Distant Drums by Jim Reeves. It didn't have a sort of an angry kind of side to it yet. It was just, hey, this is what we do. You know, we're called, we go, this is a new place, we got to stop communism. But then you started to hear sort of a counterpoint in there. Eva Destruction came out in 1965. It was banned on a lot of radio stations. Only one line in there, a reference to the Eastern world as it, it is exploding. But the whole feel of Barry Maguire being so angry in that song is like something different's going on. And then the, it started to get played out in the music. You had the early, some of the folk songs and the folk music, and some of that became anti-war music. And we heard all that stuff. We listened to it in Vietnam. We had guys playing that music in Vietnam. It was just interesting when you were in the politics of the war, when you were in the war, some of the stuff didn't seem to matter. We, we would laugh at Draft Dodger Rag and Universal Soldier. We didn't need to listen to War by Edwin Starr later on because we were in the war. Right. Um, but that music was, and then when things really started to hit, like when you started to get into Hendrix and the Doors, I mean, the Beatles went from, you know, Love Me Do to Sgt. Peppers. You know, the Beach Boys went from, you know, Fun, Fun, Fun to Good Vibrations. Every, James Brown, everybody, the, there, was, there was an edge to it. Things were changing. And that was all, I think, calibrated by and intensified by Vietnam, by the war by the protest, by the soldiers, by the college kids. It, it just, it was sort of a soundtrack to all that was going on. It was either bringing us together or separating us. By the time Nixon gets in, you know, he announces a new program called Vietnamization. That's the year when I got in after college. I got drafted and then I made it to the lottery. We were turning the ground war over to the South Vietnamese, bombing the heck out of North Vietnam to bring him to the peace table. But we thought we were all leaving. So, you know, then it was like nobody would be the last GI killed in Vietnam. Right. And you started to get a lot of in-your-face, I mean, Country Joe. I mean, we listened to I Feel Like I'm Fixing to Die all the time because we got it. It was gallows humor. It was dark humor. And, you know, we understood what he was saying. We got the song. So the music took on a more, I think, kind of either defiant or, you know, a, sort of an angry edge. But, you know, Justin, going through this whole thing from the guys that are listening to Left My Heart in San Francisco, to the guys that are listening to Soup John, Sloop John B., the guys like me that are listening to Sitting on the Dock of the Bay, the songs that we found kept coming back in the conversations, besides we got to get out of this place, with the men and women, were songs that reminded them of being lonesome and alone and God-forsaken and isolated and scared. Mm. And so, like, you know, Detroit City by Bobby Bear, Otis Redding sitting on the dock of the bay, leaving on a jet plane. Songs like that would come up over and over and over again because what rooted you and sort of kept you going besides your buddies was the fact that you were going to get out and get back and you needed that person, the loved one, you know, my girl. You know, we had tons of references to my girl just because... That's what kept guys going, was thinking about the girl back home. Right. So even though the music was going through these seismic shifts from JFK to LBJ to Nixon, and so were the soldiers and, and the, our, our attitudes in many ways, the music that sort of comforted them and consoled them, that stayed relatively consistent. This is Doug Bradley, co-author of We Gotta Get Out of This Place, the soundtrack of the Vietnam War. I'm a Vietnam veteran. I'm going to read a section from Chapter 4 of our book, Chain of Fools, subtitled Radios, Guitars, A-Tracks, and Silence in the Field. We include a number of solo pieces in the book, things written directly or transcribed from interviews we had for this book by Vietnam veterans. And this is my solo leading that chapter. The feel of Vietnam, the vibe, was like nothing I'd ever experienced. Growing up in the 1950s and 1960s, I'd always been around music, inside music, because it brought me alive. It made me smile. It gave me a reason to live. But music in Vietnam was all that and more. It seemed as if our music, 
the rock and roll sounds that we brought with us on our records and albums and cassettes, in our fingers, on our lips, and in our heads, was colliding with the brutality of war and ricocheting off the Vietnamese landscape. Smokey and the Miracles, Aretha, and Bob Dylan didn't belong here, and that made the sounds of music, our music, reverberate in new and uncommon ways. Nowhere was that more apparent than at Long Bin Post in South Vietnam, the largest army encampment in the world at that time. It was U.S. Army life in the rear with a capital R. Long Bin was basketball courts and bowling alleys and swimming pools. It was air-conditioned offices and modish clubs and live bands and AFVN and Radio First Termer. And it was the sound of the hooch, sometimes a melange of sound as a supreme stone love playing on AFVN combined with Rick Roberts's crooning the impossible dream from Man of La Mancha against the backdrop of Love the One You're With blaring from Lou Catalano's cassette deck as Rick Smith strummed his guitar to Joni Mitchell's Woodstock. The cacophony was with us night and day, early in the morning, late into the night, even in the afternoons when most of us were gone, the hooch maids and mama sons hummed their own native songs. Some nights we'd sneak tiny cassette players out to the bunker line and get stoned and pretend that Hendrix and CCR were there with us. Other nights we'd go to the EM club to hear the Six Uglies or the Soul Sisters or some other Asian band tear into James Brown and Janis Joplin. On a few memorable occasions, James Brown himself or Johnny Cash or Nancy Sinatra or another star would show up and put on a very special concert for us homesick GIs. At events like these, we remps would vacate our front row seats for the grunts who'd just come in from some heavy shit in the bush where they weren't able to listen to music like we could in the rear. It was the least we could do. Besides, the grunts would have kicked our asses if we hadn't moved aside. Sometimes in the rear, it seemed like you'd go for hours, weeks, even months, with music always by your side. The AFEN playlist was often palatable, especially at night, and for a few weeks in late 1970 and early 1971, a renegade DJ who called himself Day Rabbit would blow us away with heavy metal, psychedelic tunes, and drug anthems on Radio First Termer. Peace out, brother. Plus, one of the guys was usually strumming a tune on a guitar and the humming of the Mama Sons, the sound of music from the clubs, even the soundtracks from the movies that were shown outdoors. Point being, hooch life in Vietnam in 1970 and 1971, particularly at Long Bin, had a soundtrack that played constantly on a variety of channels, and we couldn't get enough of it. The best nights, the quieter ones that lent themselves to reflection were counterpointed by music. A handful of us would hump in the dark, back to our air-conditioned offices, unpack the expensive reel-to-reel tape decks we got from Pasex in Japan, clamp on our cost quadraphonic headphones, and listen to new albums by Cat Stevens and Carol King and George Harrison. We'd be lost in our own private worlds as we composed letters in our Army-issued typewriters to our sweethearts or wives or mothers. Then we'd make the long, slow walk back to our hooch, where, of course, music was playing. Eventually, the brass put a halt to our after-hours listening sessions there because one night we put a hole in one of the ceiling tiles trying to break into the place and tracked in mud. They singled me out as the lead troublemaker and dressed me down in front of the entire office, short as I was at that point, under 30 days left in country. I left Vietnam wishing I'd had just one more night to punctuate my favorite albums with typed words home about love and boredom and homesickness and frustration. The Long Bin Hooches, all the U.S. Hooches everywhere in Vietnam, were vacated by 1973, and by the spring of 1975, the NVA and VC had taken up permanent residence in them. Today, Long Bin, a once proud and productive rubber plantation before it became the U.S. Army's home away from home, is a shopping complex that includes a large, Western-style Cora supermarket. There's probably an old tape buried somewhere on the grounds. And if you listen hard enough, you might be able to make out Purple Haze or Proud Mary 
or we got to get out of this place. The music never stopped, even after we were long gone. We're speaking with author Doug Bradley and talking about the relationship between Vietnam veterans and the music that underscored their war. Ever since I picked up your book, I've wanted to get your thoughts on on this. I guess what you might call intergenerational co-opting. I come to it through a a quote about movies from Tony Swafford, who wrote Jarhead, who wrote, there are no anti-war movies. All the anti-war movies from Vietnam got turned into Jarhead porn uh, by the time <laughs> Gulf it's won, isn't it? And and he paints this picture of, you know, the young recruits who are about to deploy to the Gulf kind of watching Apocalypse Now and racking their clips on their helmets along with it and thrilling to the music. And that music, the anti-war music, becoming almost an exciting call for a new generation to go fight. What do you attribute that to? With you know, The songs themselves not necessarily being anti-war, but very indicative of the war, like Purple Haze and being invocative of the smoke grenades calling in Hueys, being turned around and being used as kind of like a ramp up. You're making an excellent point. And um, if you look at it, Hollywood ignored Vietnam when it was going. It was too it was too incendiary. They didn't want to get near it. You know, Ring Larder Jr., when he wrote the screenplay for MASH, had it set in Vietnam. Couldn't do that. They had to put it in Korea. Even though it was written about, the original book was about Korea, they thought they could set it in Vietnam. No, nope, Hollywood wouldn't touch it. The, you know, the Ballad of the Green Berets, the song, the book, and the film, John Wayne's film, that was the only movie that was made. So what happened later was you had, you know, because we had sort of co-opted the counterculture after Woodstock, you know, that this stuff will sell. So, yeah, let's, <laughs> let's look at people getting high and, and you know, uh, free love and all that other stuff. It was, it, it, you know, it got merchandise. And nobody did that better than Hollywood. And sometimes the way they did that was the soundtrack to the movies, which is not the soundtrack to Vietnam. If you look at, you know, for what it's worth, great song. It came up, it comes up a lot, but it comes up for specific memories that, were, that, are, that soldiers will bring to something, not because Hollywood will put that in every movie about the 60s, if, especially if there's an anti-war protest. So, you know, you had this folks, in many cases, people that weren't there. I know there were veterans that worked on Apocalypse with uh, Francis. But I just think that it became a way to tell a story evocatively through music. I mean, you know, Apocalypse is about the heart of darkness. I mean, that's as non-Vietnam as anything. Platoon is sort of half right. You can go through all the movies. You know, Good Morning Vietnam, best soundtrack. But still, the plot is ridiculous. You know, anybody that's in Vietnam will tell you that in terms of the subplot with the South Vietnamese, the Viet Cong kid and, you know, the woman he falls in love with. This is how some of the myths about Vietnam and that era had been created, and even the 60s, frankly. And that's the fact that the music was great. Um, the, we simplified the story plot. You know, there was a good and bad. The hippies and the protesters were bad. You know, the people that served and, you know, did their duty were good. It was much more complicated than that and, and much more nuanced. And I think they, in, in a way to be able to tell that story, they co-opted the music. I think you, you make... a a really interesting point, and I kind of am like ashamed of myself for not thinking of it in these terms before, but it makes so much sense that when you're sitting in the highlands, you're going to want to listen to My Girl. You're not going to sit there in the heart of darkness and listen into the end by the doors. <laughs> Why would you do that to yourself? What depressed person would do that to themselves? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Do you feel like the near total lack of anti-war music about the Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts is kind of an indictment? of our, as a culture, not paying attention to it? Or or is it something else that's happened that we don't make music about conflicts as much as we used to? I think there's a, there's, there's a lot that's going on. I think there's stuff that's happened to music. I think it's part of what was not addressed during post-Vietnam, um, especially with Vietnam vets. It's kind of the, the fact that none of us are connected to it. I mean, we do this wonderful exercise in our class when we had like we had like ten rows of ten kids when we had a hundred students in the class and realize these are young people that were you know that were born in the mid to late nineties so um, it could be the Peloponnesian Wars for all they know but they all know the music it is amazing how 
this generation of young people comes in and they know these artists, they know the music. But we ask them, um, we say, okay, the first, you know, four rows stand up and then half of every other of the next six rows stand up. That's who was eligible to go to Vietnam. That's who was touched by military service or the draft or the lottery by Vietnam. Okay, now half of the last row stand up. That's how many people are fighting the current wars. And it just it's a way to represent visually for them the fact, and they're sitting there, they know it, because these are you know fairly well-to-do kids going to the University of Wisconsin-Madison, very prestigious and elite school. They don't have skin in the game. They're not, and they don't know many people that do. So, boy, the, the civilian soldier military divide has never been larger, I don't think, in our society. I think some of that plays into it because the only people that are doing the fighting and the dying are the people that need, you know, to support one another. So why, why start saying how bad this is when we're, you know, we got to get, this is what we got. This is what we're doing. I think the other thing is, I think the, I think the music industry, we, it's become so commercialized. Yeah, that's, that's just not going to play. No executive, no record producer, no promoter is going to sit there and say, oh, yeah, I really, I think that song, and there are some of them out there. You know, I don't know if you've listened to System of a Down. Mm-hmm. Um, they've got a song, BYOB. You know, that's, it's a take on a rock. I mean, I think there's music like this out there, but we are not going to hear it. It's not going to get played. And now, of course, everybody is sort of going out and individualized their music. You know, we, somebody, so often people ask us, you know, is there going to be a book like this about Iraq and Afghanistan? We say, no way, because guys put on their headsets and their iTunes and their iPods. They played their own soundtrack. There wasn't a shared soundtrack. That's an interesting, interesting distinction, single-serving yeah, music. The, yeah. Yep. And the interesting thing is the two TAs in our class, one's a black Marine from Brooklyn and the other's a white ex-Marine from Minnesota, they talk about our music, the music of the 60s. They talk about Credence. They talk about Hendrix. They talk about The Doors as music that they listened to when they were in Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of it's kind of interesting that music would have that staying power for them, whereas, sure, they would listen to current stuff, but the person next to them or, you know, five people away wouldn't be listening to the same soundtrack. Right. And it occurs to me that maybe, you know, as far as the cultural zeitgeist goes, like while a band like the Black Keys may have never written an anti-war song, the fact that they sound like they could be from the 60s and the fact that they got popular during this war might be a kind of tonal callback. I don't know if that's a stretch or a PhD thesis. I don't think it is. I I mean, I I do think it's worth, I I think that'd be worth looking at, but I, I, I don't think that's, I don't think that's too much of a stretch. I think the prevalence of the music for me, I mean, you know, to to be on the darker side, I, I had a, I heard a great story by a DJ from KCRW who used to bartend at a VFW hall, and, and she said it was, you know, full up at 2 p.m. with Vietnam vets who would sit at the bar facing forward and not talking to each other, and they were there to drink, and this one vet would come in and pump 16 quarters in the jukebox, and it would, the song he would play on repeat again and again and again was Sam Stone by John Prine. Oh my God! Familiar, I know it's, it's. Oh yeah, it's suicide music. There's a hole I mean, in Daddy's arm. <laughs> where all the money goes. All the money right? goes. And I was listening to that the other day, and I thought, my God, wow. you know, if you totally, ch- if you change the arrangement but kept the lyrics exactly the same, with the opiate addictions and the overdoses we see killing veterans now, I mean, it's amazing how so little can change. No, you're absolutely right. But boy, I, f- I feel for those guys. <laughs> right. I wish we could throw something else in the jukebox for him. We got to get out of this place. We got to smile. I know, right? It works on two levels. Yeah. Yeah. With the time we have left, I I don't feel like people talk enough about how Vietnam influenced jazz. Can you talk a little bit about that? The musicians that came from the war and were influenced by sure. the war. Sure. One of the nice parts of the book that we realized and and uh, that I think really helped some of the guys to to heal and get their lives back together was the music that they made themselves. There were a lot of Vietnam vet musicians, again, music that didn't get a lot of play. Um, You know, of course, you know, Springsteen, people think he was a Vietnam vet. He could have been. His first drummer was killed in Vietnam. A lot of songs about Vietnam, great songs. Billy Joel did a song and, you know, uh, John Prine. Um, But the vet musicians did some of their own music, and I think some of the most interesting and um, captivating music was some of the jazz that came out of that era, um, and jazz that was, frankly, in, influenced by or played by Vietnam vets. My favorite story of that is by a guy named Billy Bang. 
Uh, his real name was, I think, William Vincent Walker, a black guy from New York who, you know, didn't have any options except to get into the military, had a horrendous experience in Vietnam, scarred him for life, as it did many, many, many men and women. He came back. He joined a black revolutionary group, and he was given money by them and told to go into a pawn shop and buy a gun. And he went into the pawn shop, and he just looked, and there was a violin on the wall. And it was, he just talks about this amazing experience where he thought the violin was talking to him, was speaking to him, basically saying, buy me. He bought the violin and not the gun, probably saved his life and maybe saved some other lives, and became a jazz violinist. And what he did with his music, you can, any of Billy's songs are fantastic, any of the people he played with. But then after 20 years, when he it finally he realized that what he was trying to bury with the music and his life and maybe some of the self-medication was the Vietnam experience. He recorded two albums about Vietnam and his experience there. They are unbelievable to listen to. And they, with his jazz violin at the center of it, but also other great musicians, several of whom were Vietnam vets, just the whole the feel of of being there. You know, we talk about Hendrix doing that and songs like Machine Gun and how his, sonically, Hendrix was Vietnam. Billy Bang and his jazz is very, very much the same way. He's got a song called, you know, Flashlight in a 45, Tunnel Rat. And boy, <laughs> uh, worst job in the world to go down in the tunnels and try and find the Viet Cong that were down there. But you, you if you listen to that song, you exactly have that experience. You know, and he, he influenced other other musicians and jazz musicians. You know, I think there's a way you can make an argument that what Marvin Gaye did with what's going on and the fact that it's one long song that goes from, you know, what's, uh, you know, what's going on into what's happening, brother, and ends with inner city blues. There's a jazz element to that in terms of how the music plays and how it resonates and, and how improvisational it is. And uh, we had another guy in the book, Kima Williams, who wrote a symphony, a classical symphony. He went... He wanted to be a jazz musician, but he ended up, um, you know, studying in uh, at, at the Berklee School of Music, and he wrote a symphony. But there's there's some incredible jazz elements in the symphony. It's called Symphony for the Sons of Nam that Kimo infuses in there. And we have great stories in the book too about you know jazz that was played in Vietnam, guys who listened to jazz in Vietnam, and Alfredo Vea, who is a Vietnam vet who's written a wonderful book called Gods Go Begging, does wonderful things with jazz. He felt jazz was the way to explain the Vietnam experience. And he does a thing in there with improvisation in his book called Supposin. And it's a bunch of, you know, grunts on this hill where we don't need to take it, but they're going to make us try and take it and we're all going to get killed. This is one of the unfortunate legacies of Vietnam or, you know, the situations. And they're, they're mainly, you know, black and Puerto Rican um, and poor white working class. And they start this thing with Supposin, like, well, Supposin... The Puritans had gotten blown off course and it ended up, you know, down in Costa Rica, you know, and we had landed uh, and we had lived up in Plymouth. You know, what would have what would have happened? You know, supposing, um, you know, it was a you know, there were the astronauts were all African-American or Mexican. There were Mexicans in space Mm -hmm. and they do this wonderful thing that is very jazz like, very improvisational, but it helps them at least for a few moments to forget the dire situation they're in. I think for a lot of Vietnam vets, that that not only happened in Vietnam, it happened in their daily lives. And maybe that approach to life and, and, and jazz was a way for some of them to survive. Mm. I, uh, I want to ask my last question that I ask everybody uh, who's a contributor on our show. If you were to encounter a uh, enlisted person or an officer in the military right now who was about to term out in a few weeks, and you could give them one piece of advice, what do you think it would be? Hmm. But it's a great question. Don't be afraid to tell your story. Don't be afraid to talk about what you see and what you experience because it's only by sharing that and having people who will support you in that sharing that you're going to be able to cope with it. Doug Bradley, thanks so much for being on Incoming. It's been a pleasure. Justin, thank you so much. 
Talking with Doug got me wanting to ask Iraq and Afghanistan veterans what music carried them through their deployments. Remembering everything Doug said about how the medium of music has changed so much since Vietnam. Instead of listening to albums communally around the record player, every one of us has our own single serving playlist on an MP3 player or iPhone right in our pocket. We don't even experience music as an album anymore unless we actively choose to. So I called up three other contributors to Incoming, veterans of the Forever Wars, to ask them about what music carried them through their deployments and what their relationship to music was while they were downrange. So here's Matthew Kamatsu, Nathan Fletcher, Brooke King, and Sage Foley. If you haven't already, be sure to check them out on the other episodes they're featured on. What music were you listening to that was your ramp up song or that was getting you through your deployment? What was your go to playlist and some of the songs on that go to playlist? Well, you got to remember my first deployment was in 2002, so uh, it, it's changed over the years. Um, so, wow, this is going to be a little bit embarrassing, but I remember listening to a lot of trance like Paul Oakenfold and uh, Petey Pablo. I don't know if you're familiar with Petey Pablo. Oh, Afghanistan yeah. 02 is definitely my uh, my my go to war music. Uh, Iraq 03 to 04, I listened to uh, a lot of Seven Dust, and then ever since then, um, it's been uh, just a lot of hip hop. So uh, um, <laughs> yeah, it, a little strange to find this on Lieutenant Colonel's playlist, but um, I listen to uh, a lot of like trap rap and stuff like that when i'm trying to get amped up oh that's a, you know it's funny when you mention songs that you remember this is the dumbest story ever uh we were in kuwait getting ready to to drive forward um into iraq and this was the early days of kind of mp3 and, and ipods and these types of things and my buddy kevin cherry i'll never forget this as long as i live he had one he had a little mp3 player but he messed up the download and he only put one song on it and and so we were literally on this like 14 hour adventure of picking up armored doors and figuring out where they go and we're driving and we're seeing the military you hurry up and wait and you'd sit and we sat there for 14 hours and we listened to that uh that little troy song want to be a baller and uh <laughs> and, and and i'll never forget you know and, and a shot collar 20 inch blade i mean i could literally go and we, we we made it our mission to try and understand the lyrics to that song uh, without having any access to look him up, and uh, and and Kevin, I, I call him Fatty, but every time I see him, we we every time we get on the phone, one of us will start singing. And then I think music shapes you even when you come back. You know, I mean, when you listen to, um, I, I like Pearl Jam. I, I go to as many concerts as I can. But yeah, you know, the song Garden. I mean, it, it, they're talking about a garden of stone. You know, with my hands bound, with my my war paint on, with my shadow flag, I walk into your garden of stone, uh, which a lot of us believe was a cemetery. And you're talking about literally, you know, marching to your death and what that means and certainly alive. And even on Pearl Jam, even uh, Yellow Lead Better is a song that Eddie Vedder's talked about was a, a yellow letter that someone got that said their brother had died in Vietnam. Uh, and the song is about finding the letter and then walking through the streets and seeing people on the porch with the flags and this kind of alternative reality and, and universe. You would use music in a lot of ways to escape. Uh, you would use it to to be excited and then you would use it I think subliminally to to try and provide some comfort and some peace and it's not just music I mean there's a lot of literature that does that you know you read you know man's search for meaning you read on killing you read a lot of these things and some of it's while you're there and then a lot of it's afterwards where you're trying to make sense of it all and you're trying to figure out what did that mean why did we do it um, it's particularly hard I think with Iraq vets when you look at a situation that's objectively worse than it was before you went and and you have these these questioning and you know why why did people die and why did we do this and was it worth it and should we not have done it um being in iraq you couldn't think about like god i have a year i mean you know, you're getting mortared and ieds and all and you just you think about like i'm gonna survive today i'm gonna fight today and then when i go to bed if i go to bed and then i get up the next day and you know what i'm gonna survive today and uh, and i think childhood war political campaigns are much the same um it's just a, a consistent theme across the board and a lot of those Music, books, literature, poems, I still think about daily because uh, that never leaves you. You know, your childhood never leaves you. Your war experience never leaves you. They make you who you are, and you got to figure out how you channel that into a loving, productive, caring, compassionate place 
because the alternate direction is is not good uh, for anybody. At the, so. end, the light at the end of the tunnel is you understand the lyrics to the baller. Yes, that's right. That's right. When I was on Convoy, cliche as it sounds, is shit that would get me angry and pumped up at the same time. Because I had to go into that mode where, where you're no longer thinking of human beings and what they do outside of, you know, that element that you're in at that moment. But that that person is trying to kill me and I need to not only protect myself, but the people around me who rely on me. So you kind of have to get in this weird, what I call shutting off the humanity switch. And for me, listening to like Slipknot was a really good way. Like, and Marilyn Manson and, you know, like it was just one of those reasons they just, I don't know, it put me in that weird mindset that you have to be in in order to take someone else's life. Like there are some songs I listened to from my childhood while I was in Iraq to kind of help me remember who I was too. So like I grew up, you know, my traveling with the Grateful Dead with my dad. So like I, even Led Zeppelin. Like, I would listen to Led Zeppelin, too, just kind of, like, remembering that that's what my dad used to listen to. And even my dad introduced me to the Ramones when I was a little kid, too. So it's a way to forget where you are, but also remember who you are in terms of, you know, uh, not socially and, you know, politically, but familial as well. There's one song that I still can't listen to to this day, and, it, and it, every time I hear it, I'm like, dude, turn that off. Please turn that off. The song Hurt by um, Nine Inch Nails that Johnny Cash covered. Like, to this day, I still cannot listen to that song. Like, every single time, it, I just break down in tears. And it's a, it's, it just, it, there's a mental, you know, block there because it was one of the songs that I was listening to to try and, you know, remember who I was. At the same time, one of my buddies had just committed suicide while in Iraq and, and, um, and, you know, dealing with recovering dead bodies that day and, and just the, all the stuff. And then all of a sudden, like, I want to say like five or six years later, you know, I'm in the States and I'm hanging out with everyone and the song comes on. And I'm like, oh, I have to turn it off, just turn it off. And they wouldn't turn it off. I walked over, they grabbed the radio and I slammed it on the ground to stop it from playing. That's that one song you can never hear and never listen to again. So you were on the USS Mercy as a surgical technician on a show face tour to Southeast Asia. That is right. All right. What were your songs that really bring all that back for you and why? Well, it all started with um, uh, my ex-wife who... I met in in Guam and she was a surgical tech with me in the hospital and she was trying to teach me bachata for uh, six months um, but she was terrible at it um, teaching part that is she would <laughs> get really frustrated about 14 seconds in, into trying to teach me the very simple two steps that I was trying with all my uncoordinated self to master. Anyway, so I jump on board with that and eager to figure this out, to get back to her, just, you know, dancing bachata better than she can. I got all the music that I need. I, I have all Romeo Santos songs. So I met this wonderful Dominican man who uh, was a cook in the galley, and I would shoot shit with him all the time because I could never sleep and he was you could say up early um, cooking the first round of breakfast but really that was like two or three in the morning he was an incredible bachata dancer we got a bunch of people together and there was this space right outside the galley so then we are headed towards uh, one of the islands in Indonesia on this little boat that took us from the ship to the shore, and it was really rough and <laughs> bouncy. It took about an hour and a half to get from where we were anchored to the to where we were going on shore. He had his iPad, and he had this music video, uh, Romeo Santos and uh, Usher, uh, called Promise. It's uh, it's awful. Um, <laughs> it's <laughs> I just watch that shit like uh, a couple hundred times over there a couple hundred times back 
You could say I was trying to memorize the movement, but also I missed my wife at the time. Like, hell, uh, we weren't very good at missing each other because she needed me all the time on the phone and I <laughs> was in the OR like 17 hours a day. So there was a lot of pain there. So I do not speak Spanish. <laughs> In tus manos yo cali, y mis contros sobre mí. Tu cura pasas que Dios tu dionero, y además quiero salir, condenado soy feliz. Try to keep my balance, but I still fall. But how'd I fall so hard Right into your arms, I swear, girl Wrapped inside you, baby, and it's so warm Love without a cause Leaves me trapped inside my own box Quiero ser tuyo enterido, pero tengo miedo Promente mi que no me vas a dejar sin tu amor. I give you my heart, girl, but you gotta promise, promente mi mami. Promise you hold me, love me, love me, way past forever. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Those were incoming contributors Matthew Kamatsu, Nathan Fletcher, Brooke King, and Sage Foley. And that's our show. Incoming is produced by myself, Justin Hudnall. Jennifer Pepperpot Corley is our editor and sound designer. At KPBS, Kurt Conan is our audio engineer. Lisa Morris at Zap is operations manager. John Decker is director of programming. And Nate John is our innovation specialist and unapologetic fan of Ed Sheeran. Music and the scoring of Doug Bradley's story, National Anthem, was by Gillicuddy. For his story, Meditation, you heard from the Agrarians. And for his story, Chain of Fools, he was accompanied by Sun Little. Support for Incoming comes from the KPBS Explorer Program, the California Arts Council, Veterans Initiative and the Arts, Cal Humanities, and supporting members of So Say We All. Learn more about us on our website at www.sosayweallonline.com. And we would, honest to God, love it if you drop us a line via email, share your thoughts, tell us how we're doing, give us some of your stories at info at sosayweallonline.com. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll talk again soon. <laughs>